Mm. Yeah? Okay, so uh, we continue. Financial management, 11. Previous one was financial management, 10. Now it's financial management, 11. We're up to number seven, mutual funds. I completed that. Now, let's clarify another important little detail. One important type of mutual fund is the pension fund. As such, some people think that pension fund is a separate, uh, over here, financial institution and a separate special type of financial institution. Others think of the pension fund just as a specialized mutual fund. Now, another important type of mutual fund, and we can separate it out as number, uh, let's say, eight, is money market mutual fund. And money market mutual fund is a simply mutual fund which invests or we say specializes in money market instruments. Uh, which they invest only in, now we write down short term. low risk financial instruments. Let me try to see if I can recover the three primary money market instruments, three main instruments. The first main instrument is T-bill. T-bill, sometimes TV. They love to invest in T-bills. So everything they got left available as funds, they put in T-bills. T-bills are the safest, the most liquid, and therefore yield or provide the lowest return. Number two, CDs, which were covered. Certificates of deposits issued by commercial banks. And the third one is CP, commercial paper, issued by good, high quality corporations. So these three could easily consist over 90% of their uh, funds. And the third characteristic, which many, not all, but many mutual funds provide, is called check writing, check writing. And check writing is simply service that allows to write a check and make a payment against your mutual fund. So, as soon as you have check writing, and overall the mutual fund is low risk and safe, it begins to act just like a bank account, just like a deposit. And for a while they've been actually used by investors as a substitute for a bank account and therefore because sometimes people abuse them they say yeah you have check writing capabilities but you can write five checks per month limit okay you can't write any more uh, so they have what we call this limited check writing capability five checks per month that's it or ten checks per month that's it. or two checks per month okay so these are money market Mutual funds, okay, very popular because of their safety, liquidity, and check writing we call convenience, easy to use. Just write the check, no big deal. Yes, question. Again? Uh, no, usually don't. They usually don't limit the amount of check. You can write anything for as much as you want. You can write the check to basically buy a house with it, or buy a car, or make a 
That's the beauty of a mutual fund, is that you can withdraw it practically at any time, practically with no notice. They just say, one day notice, okay? Uh, meaning, tell us today, we'll give you the money tomorrow. For the commercial bank, they gotta give it to you today. Now, even today, commercial banks don't do this anymore for liquidity management purposes. For example, in Bulgaria, in many countries around the world, they say, oh, you want more than 5,000 euro or more than 5,000 US dollars? The answer is no, you gotta give us three day advance notice. Yes, we'll give you the money, but you gotta give us a three days advance notice. Because somewhere in a province, in a small town, you can't just walk in the bank and expect 10,000 euro laying in cash. Like, right? do you have 10,000 euro in the local bank here? And the answer is probably no, okay? If 10,000 US dollars laying around, you probably not. So they may need to take it from headquarters to the uh, or local branch, or they say, well, we gotta go to headquarters to get it. We got the money, but it's not in here in the, you know, in the vault. Okay, so that's, uh, is that answering your question? All right, next one is exchange traded funds. That's uh, according to book number eight, so for me, I added number nine, E-T-F. Oh, okay, I forgot one other important note. I forgot I was thinking about it. When you uh, page back on the book, on page 126, and in 126 you see the table on the left says, summary of major market instruments. Uh, on the left, the fifth one says, money market mutual funds is an instrument. And the answer is big, no, money market mutual fund is a financial institution. It's not an instrument. Yes, they issue shares and the share of a money market mutual fund is an instrument. And it's very easy to confuse the share with the institution. But this is exactly the same as uh, confusing, let's say, Acer Corporation with a share of Acer Corp. It's not the same thing. A share is a share. The share is the instrument. Acer Corporation is a business, okay? So legally, the share only represents part ownership. So money market mutual fund is a financial institution which people commonly confuse that it's actually an instrument. No. A share in a market, money market mutual fund is an instrument. Now, it is exactly the same with mutual funds. Mutual funds are, when I said here, no leverage. What does it mean, no leverage? The meaning is that there is no debt. And if there is no debt, this means that it's all equity. All equity, that's how it's called, all equity. All equity means the right-hand side of the balance sheet has only owner's equity and nothing else. 100% all equity. So you're going to have mutual fund shares. That's how it's called. Say, oh, I own 25 shares of that particular mutual fund. So mutual fund is a financial institution. It is all equity. As all equity, it means that it issues shares, okay? So, when people say, oh, I've invested 25,000 in a mutual fund, technically, legally, it simply means that they purchased shares, so many shares. It could be 12.3 shares of that mutual fund, okay? That's all it means. So. Mutual fund is an institution, it will issue share, and the share of a mutual fund will be the financial instrument, okay? Same thing with money market mutual funds, they will issue shares, and the share is the instrument. Okay, back to ETF. ETF, and I remembered again, that's how I came, is actually a closed end mutual fund. So it is usually a mutual fund. I don't want to get into the technicality of 
closed in and open in, the, the one can issue shares, the other one can't issue additional shares, or they can buy back the shares or cannot buy back the shares. So I don't want to get into the technicality of closed end and open end, but an ETF is, let's write it out in good English, exchange traded, exchange traded fund and stands E T F. An exchange traded fund is a fund, is a mutual fund. A very special type of mutual fund which issues, uh, we call them now tradable shares or public shares. Publicly traded, publicly traded. shares. So let's clarify now the difference. Money market funds issue shares, okay, and you own the shares, but it's not publicly traded. The only thing you can do is you can give the share back, you sell it back to the mutual fund and the mutual fund will give you the cash. This process is called, let's write it here in English, both for mutual fund and pension funds uh, uh, called redemption. Redemption is the process where investor sells the, to the mutual fund its own shares and the mutual fund buys back its own shares from the investor okay and pays him in cash and most actually all mutual funds are required to redeem required to redeem so if you give them the shares back in other words if you want your investment money back they must pay you back at the end or after the end of the closing. So, redemption is required for mutual funds. Redemption is also required for money market mutual funds. Well, that's the beauty of it. The beauty of it is, you want your money back, you can get it anytime you want on the next day, okay? No big deal. In an ETF, you can't get your money back, but you own a share and the share is publicly traded. It is on the exchange, for example, example, GLD. GLD is a share and represents one-tenth of an ounce of gold. There is actually a repository, it's backed supposedly by gold, and it is trades just like an ordinary stock share. You can buy them, you can sell them, you can trade them, you can short them, you can borrow them. Whatever you can legally do, we call them leverage them, okay, and you can margin them. Anything that you can legally do with a stock or with a share, you can do with an exchange traded fund. And the exchange traded fund could be for a commodity like gold. It could be commodity like silver, S L. B. It could be for other commodity like crude oil. So, question I had before from one of you a long time ago, two months ago, is uh, how do we invest in oil? Well, the answer is there is an exchange traded fund for oil. Okay. Well, can we invest in natural gas? The answer is yeah. There is an you know uh, ETF for uh, gas. Well, what about copper? Same answer. There's an ETF for copper. Now, how safe is your investment? And the answer is, you buy an extra risk. One is the risk of copper or gold or silver, and the other risk is the counterparty risk. Counterparty risk.
and counterparty risk is that the ETF, we call it sponsor, sponsor, is usually the business, a financial institution which organizes and runs the close end fund, is that the sponsor has not designed it well, or didn't invest in all the gold, or they decided to have somebody else. It's called, uh, let's use another word, custodian. Custodian is a business, usually financial institution, but not necessarily, which holds the investment assets for you. So, if you have a gold ETF, you probably have 10 tons of gold, okay? These tens of tons of gold sit somewhere in storage in Switzerland, or Hong Kong, or London, or New York, and someone is holding that gold for you. So, that someone is called a custodian. So the investment bank or the whatever, whoever is the sponsor, will hire a custodian to hold the gold for them. The gold might be there, might not be there. They might be uh, actually checking for the gold, they might not be. They might be crooks, okay? Or they might say, oh, we got gold, but they don't have gold. They have, let's say, gold futures contracts. In case they need the gold, they can actually take delivery of the gold from the futures uh, exchange and then say, well, we want the gold. They say, well, we got to wait for two months to get it. And then they're going to get it from the exchange, the futures exchange. And when they take it from the exchange, they're going to return it back to you. So you don't know what's happening with the custodian. The custodian may have lent the gold out to make a little extra money and profit for himself. And when the custodian goes bankrupt, suddenly you lost your gold. Okay? Meaning you suffered from a counterparty risk. Well, that's the view. That's the counterparty risk that I'm explaining. Is ETFs are marketed, it's advertising, is extremely safe. Oh, it's there. But in the real world, they might be there, they might not be there. They might be lent, they might be relent, they might be margined. In other words, they will borrow against that money, which is not their money, it's the investor's money. So bankers could be playing 101 different games to make and earn a little extra money, but they earn extra money for one reason. You get extra return only for extra risk. And when they risk, is they risk your goal or your bonds. In other words, they put at risk your asset. And that risk will later on re represent counterparty risk. And if they go bankrupt, sorry, too bad. You should have known better, okay? And they say, you should have known to keep your gold buried in the yard, right? Or in a safe deposit box or, box or some other place. So they have their risks. Well, you say, well, can you diversify against this risk? Yeah, you can get one ETF for oil, another one for gold, another one for silver, another one for copper, another one for bonds. You can get a whole bunch of different, 10 or 20 different ETFs. And yeah, there is for all of them some counterparty risk, but it's not likely that five out of 20 is gonna blow up on you. Maybe one will blow up on you, but the other 19 will be okay. So, there is some risk, but you can diversify that risk. Again, you gotta make sure that the custodian and the sponsor is not the same JP Morgan, that you got 10 ETS, you think you're diversified, turns out that the sponsor is always JP Morgan, and when JP Morgan goes bust, suddenly you lose most of your money, and you didn't realize that you were concentrating your own risk when you thought you were diversifying. All right, nine uh, in my list here becomes 10. Hedge funds. Uh, hedge funds are different in many ways from 
mutual fund. So hedge fund is a financial institution which specializes in investing. We call it, again, money management. But the first key characteristic out of which follows everything else is that it's unregulated. There are very few regulations. They can do basically whatever they want. They can invest in stocks, bonds, currencies. Very, very commonly they are leveraged. They basically borrow to leverage up. They also invest heavily in derivatives. Which by nature are highly leveraged, high risk financial instruments. Now, derivatives could be used for hedging purposes and sometimes they use them for hedging purposes, but the derivatives most commonly used in hedge funds is to enhance risk and enhance return. Hedge fund managers think that they know better, that they are smarter, that they can forecast the movement of the particular market, and they take a leveraged derivative position to profit from it if they are right. So they love to use leverage, they love to use derivatives, and with leverage and deliver, uh, de uh, derivatives, let's add one more instrument uh, or type of instrument. We'll call them exotic instruments. Exotic means not very commonly used, rare, used by specialized or sophisticated investors or having special features and characteristics uncommon okay rare highly specialized so these three mean that hedge funds are very typically high risk high return And the basic principle for, uh, let's look back at mutual funds, no debt, no leverage means no bankruptcy. Mutual fund can lose money, but it can't go bankrupt. It can't go bankrupt if you have everything is all equity, okay? So here, because you got leverage, you can easily go bankrupt. It's very easy to go bankrupt. Now, they're highly leveraged. 10 to 1, 20 to 1, so a small loss in assets of 10 or 20 percent, the position moves against you, and hedge funds easily go bankrupt. Well, what does it mean go bankrupt? It means that they lose their investors' money. Their investors' money is the equity of the hedge fund. And when the hedge fund goes bankrupt, it also goes insolvent. That's what it also means. When it can't pay its debt, it sure can't pay its equity either. Okay? So it goes insolvent and investors lose everything and sometimes creditors could also lose a lot. And what we discussed in the other class, which was a most important trend of uh, investment banking, is that investment banking, trading and investing, the trading and investing and what's also called risk management has converted most modern investment banks into a classic hedge fund where they're running basically a hedge fund with a few additional functions like underwriting, brokerages, market making and all others. So modern investment banks, before they all went bankrupt, because they are all bankrupt now, uh, before they all went bankrupt in the 2008 and 2009, were simply basic 
hedge funds. They have converted and switched to hedge funds because a hedge fund provides high return with high risk. And when the risk turned against them, they went all bankrupt. And when they all went bankrupt, the government bailed them out by converting them to commercial banks or financial conglomerate, financial services, and allowing them to borrow from the central bank temporarily so that they can survive and keep on going. Now, why would the government do that? Because investment banks like mutual funds can be highly interconnected. As I was explaining in the previous lecture, well, two lectures ago, they are connected to mutual funds. They are connected to hedge funds. They are connected to pension funds. They are connected to commercial banks. So collapsing investment bank can easily collapse a whole bunch of other institutions around it and easily can collapse the whole financial system. Similar thing could happen with a hedge fund. If the hedge fund is huge and has borrowed a huge amount of money, whoever lent the money to the hedge fund could get easily. If the hedge fund's in trouble, the lender can get in trouble. And the lender, if it's an investment bank or commercial bank or whoever lent the money to the hedge fund, could get in trouble and lots of other problems. Uh, let me see what else we got uh, about, well, I mean, story is huge, but that's the basics of hedge funds. Let's see what else we got. Oh, private equity, 11. What's the question? Uh, can you repeat? What's what? After derivatives? Hmm? Leverage? Exotic. Oh, oh, exotic. Okay, exotic. Uh, well, you need hmm? exotic instruments. Exotic financial instruments. Uh, we don't study typically exotic financial instruments. Financial instruments which are rare, special, highly specialized, highly customized, usually some sort of derivatives, exotic instruments. They are very common. Many professionals are not familiar with exotic instruments. Many finance programs don't teach at all exotic instruments, so many professionals don't know them. So it's only a small world that knows, and there could be hundreds or thousands of different variations of exotic instruments, okay? Exotic instruments, okay, let's write this out, are created through or coming from financial innovation. What is financial innovation? It is the design and creation of new financial instruments, most of them exotic in nature, with new risk and return characteristics. That's financial innovation. And of course, you use these instruments to avoid regulation, like credit default swap. They, you know, they designed it, created it, perfected it, and legally, they made it so that it's by nature insurance, but it turns out to be unregulated, okay? So credit default swaps just 10 years ago were new and very exotic, okay? As one of the many examples, okay? You got different types of securitization. You got a mortgage-backed security, like 10,000, uh, uh, let's say, mortgages, and out of it, you slice it and dice it, and you get a CDO. And CDO, we haven't studied it yet, uh, is uh, basically a securitized, uh, you know, pool of a number of mortgage-backed securities. And again, these are all highly exotic and highly customized. Okay, so you need a lot of formulas, math to calculate the risk, the return, and everything else. Question? Question? Okay, so I was to private equity. 
Now, private equity is, uh, let me write out because it's sometimes confusing, private equity companies. So, private equity is considered business company, is, is not legally and technically is not considered a financial institution, but economics, its nature, by nature, it is a financial institution. And it does exactly that. It invests in equity, invests in, let's use another word, illiquid equity, and let me clarify with the next characteristics, and usually take control. Control will mean that they have a majority ownership, or we call it also controlling stake. So they own a large enough percentage of the company to the point where they control it, okay? And it's illiquid equity. Usually the equity might not be even publicly traded, okay? So when do they do this? They do this when the company is, we say now, new. So this is done only for new companies. These companies in business we call immature, so new young company, maybe one year old, immature, these are five guys who think they're smart enough to create that pill which will make you lose fat without running on the track, okay? Now, will that make a lot of money? Yeah, is that going to make? Yes, sir, sure. It, you can easily make billions, tens of billions of dollars. That's going to be the most profitable because people are lazy. They don't want to run on the racetrack. It takes sweating. It takes hard work. Okay? This is going to be terrifically profitable if you can just give them the pill and they can lose weight. But it's going to be extremely risky. We haven't done this. Human civilization for thousands of years haven't found the magic pill that's going to make the fat guy skinny without hard work and exercise. So, when you have a young and immature, it is going to be very high risk and also extremely high return. If you get that pill, you can increase your investment 100 times easily. You can make 1,000 times your money, possibly, okay? If you can make that particular. Well, now in these days, it might be 10 engineers trying to make the special electric car battery, a battery for electric car that can run the car for 500 kilometers. That will make you a ton of money, easily 100 times your investment. But again, what's the chance of 10 guys in a garage or in a lab being able to succeed in this thing? The answer is very low. So the chance of failure is high, very high risk, but if they succeed, very high return. So they're going to be investing in dozens, maybe hundreds of these companies, hoping two or three or five out of 100 will work, and that these five is going to make money good enough for 500. So, Private equity companies usually are in the highest risk investments with the highest possible returns. It requires extraordinary expertise. And it also, these investments are all long term. If you're going to be investing for three years in those guys hoping to make the battery, they're not going to make it tomorrow morning. They're not going to make it in a month. They will need two or three years to make a prototype and another two or three years to manufacture it. So these investments are usually very long-term investments. Question you have? What, what does this differ from a venture fund? Oh yeah, it's kind of like the same. It's the same as venture. Venture fund, okay. Uh, let's put it in here. 
Uh, let's try to see if I can figure out for you. Venture, yeah, that's kind of like the same. The main difference in venture fund, and let's clarify now, and I'll underline for you the difference, and let's use a new term. It's called pre-IPO. Pre-IPO. IPO means initial public offering. This is the first time the company sells shares. Pre-IPO means that they will invest in the company which it has not yet issued shares, not yet issued shares, but is likely to issue shares soon, okay? So it is, again, high risk, high return, new young. Here, the key characteristic of pre-IPO is replaced with illiquid. They might actually be investing in some companies which actually will have some trading, publicly traded shares, but the difference is that here the shares of the company is small, it's tiny, it's very illiquid, okay, and they'll still have the controlling share, okay? Here in venture fund, they don't need or insist on controlling share. This is okay, this is a little company, it's likely to go public, and we're gonna just take a 5% stake in the company. You understand the difference? Here, in a venture fund, you don't need to have a control. You can have a small share, 5%, 10%. Here, you're gonna have 30 to 100%. 30 to 100%. So the private equity fund could own 30%, 40%, 50%, 70%, 100%, okay? In a venture fund, you say, oh, this company is likely to go public. You're gonna own only 5%. Okay? So you're not going to be having controlling stake. Or they could be investing in a small illiquid company and they could be buying slowly so that they can gain eventually control of the company. Okay? The key is control and illiquid. Here the key is pre-IPO. Let's see what they say. Okay, oh, here's another characteristic. Let's write it out. Uh, running out of Board. Okay, we can do this thing here. Running out of board, 12. But uh, it's for us venture funds, 12. So, in a venture fund, we say they buy and manage. I'm using here the sentence on page 131. On the last paragraph 10, uh, you have the third line is called buy and manage. So, when they take control of the company, what do you mean control? They buy a majority stake and then they run the company, okay? That's the same thing. Control, if they got 50 or 60%, they own it, okay? They own it and they just run it. That's all there is to it. They manage it. Question? Yeah, it's the same one. Venture fund, this is the continuation of venture fund. You just say that the difference is that one gets it. Oh, 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 11. Yeah, yeah, my mistake. My mistake. 11. Sorry, my mistake. This is all venture. My mistake. This is uh, 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 private equity. Private equity. Private equity. Bit. equity fund. Okay, my mistake. Private equity fund is the one that has the control, okay? And if you gain the control, then you own it, you run it, you manage it, okay? And usually they'll gain the control through tremendous leverage. In other words, the private equity fund will borrow the money from the bank and when they borrow, they'll basically buy out the firm. 
Okay, so they'll buy out the firm and then they'll manage it. Okay, they'll just purchase the company. Okay, so they take a loan and purchase. Now, okay, if it's called leverage, let's clarify now another, another one. The financial instrument is called leveraged loan. leveraged loan. So, the private equity takes the leveraged loan, they say we want 20 million from the bank, the bank gives them the loan, and with the loan they buy the stock of the corporation and they own it, okay? So, a loan which is used to buy stock or controlling stake in a company is called a leveraged loan, okay? And it will or can result in, it's called LBO, leverage buyout. But here's the trick. Leverage buyout is for publicly traded companies, okay? So you can have leveraged loan to buy a non-public company, okay? Or highly illiquid company. Or you can use a leveraged loan to buy a publicly traded company company called leveraged buyout, okay? So, I mean, it's the same thing, it's the same instrument, but in the one case you use to buy a big company like Acer or some other major. In the other case you just buy a small company. And we got one last one, which is, uh, they haven't put it, I don't know why and how, brokers, brokerages. So it's going to be one, twelve, it becomes 13. Brokerage. And brokerage is a financial institution which specializes on the secondary markets. Secondary markets. Okay. They can specialize with institutional customers or they can possibly specialize in retail retail means individuals okay institutional will be again all of these they could be hedge funds mutual funds, private equity funds, all sorts of other things, okay? And brokerage basically executes orders. All they do is they buy and they sell for the customer. A typical brokerage will have minimum risk. Okay, let me change. Minimum investment risk. This means if the stock goes down, they don't take any loss. It is the customer's stock, okay? If the stock goes up, they don't take any profit. It's the customer's stock. So what they do is they execute orders for their customers not for themselves. Therefore, they don't take any position, they don't take any ownership, and therefore they don't take any risk. Now, risk is entirely borne by investment risk by their customers. They work for fees, brokerage fee. is simply the price for the brokerage service. The price you pay to buy or sell a stock. They say buying stocks, one trade, $15. Buying, $15 selling. So if you want to buy stocks, $15, they charge a flat fee, guaranteed, okay? And that's the brokerage fee. Usually, brokeraging goes hand in hand, as I explained 
before with investment, well, it's not, let me see where it is, with investment, yeah, here, with investment banking, and they are investment bankers act sometimes as dealers, they risk their own capital, or as brokers when they risk their customers' capital. In other words, if the customer's money, that's at risk. And sometimes they will be broker dealer. They will be acting as dealers, they'll be separately acting as brokers. So you may have specialized brokers. They, they're not acting as dealers, they don't act as market makers, they don't do any of the other stuff, okay? These are pure brokerages. Or they may be as part of an investment bank, or they may be as part of a financial conglomerate. A financial conglomerate, well, an insurance branch, investment banking branch, commercial banking branch, mortgage banking branch, and they'll also have a respectively brokerage branch, okay, or area, okay? And with this, let me take a look. Seems that I've covered everything on financial institutions, okay? Finished.